I don't want to forget to mention our annual conference, which will be in Miami Beach this year, October 22nd through the 24th. We've got a lot of great programming lined up, starting with this webinar today. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our moderator for today's program, Celine Dimitrovich, Director of Research for the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, otherwise known as CASEL. Celine, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So I'm just going to bring up the slide with my face there so you all can <laughs> see me. Uh, it's great to be here today and I appreciate the opportunity to moderate this session. There are going to be uh, three speakers and uh, after each of the speakers we're going to have time for questions and then we're going to have a question and answer session at, at the very end. Uh, the three speakers for today, the first speaker will be Hannah Baptiste. She's a program associate with the Susan Crown Exchange. Our second speaker will be Charles Smith. He's executive director of the David Weikert Center for Youth Program Quality. And our third speaker will be Karen Pittman, co-founder, president, and CEO of the Forum for Youth Investment. And so as I said, I'll be uh, moderating the session and introducing uh, the transition between each of these speakers and facilitating the questions uh, that come up uh, after each session and again at the end. But before I do that, I'd like to just take a moment to provide a little bit of a definition overview of SEL and of uh, some of the research resource, uh, resources on the research for this effective uh, programming and what characteristics uh, make up the best programming. So just to begin with, uh, I'm going to advance the slide here, uh, just a, a general overview of a definition of, of social emotional learning. I, I'm sure we all have a similar perspective on this, but it's nice to just get grounded in a similar framework before we hear multiple perspectives. SEL really is the process through which children and adults develop these fundamental emotional and social skills. There's a lot of different definitions floating around right now, a lot of different terms for this, non-cognitive, non-academic. At CASEL, the organization that I'm from, We've uh, used a similar framework since the late 1990s to organize these uh, skills, uh, behaviors, dispositions into a, a group, a framework for ease of communication and, and to um, try to organize all these different perspectives on, on these skills. And what you see in our framework here is that we divide these into self and other skills. The red represents um, self-oriented skills and, and behaviors and the blue are other oriented skills and behaviors, and then we have a fifth dimension which is responsible decision making. And within each of these, we uh, pay attention to both the awareness that one needs as well as the management um, of skills in those areas. So we make that distinction, and I think this has been um, a useful framework. CASEL has done a lot of research on um, social emotional interventions, both in school settings and out of school settings, and I just wanted to mention one review that was conducted by um, Durlach, Weisberg, and Pashan. I'll actually share this um, with the organizers so that you guys can get a copy of this um, review because I think it's very useful for uh, communicating the importance of, of out-of-school programming because it really established the effectiveness uh, of this work. And this review um, was done in 2010 and it included uh, Six, really uh, 68 different programs, all that had a focus on promoting social or personal growth in participants. And these cut across elementary, middle, and high school. And the review really helped establish the evidence base for out-of-school programming. What you can see here is that across all three of these domains, uh, programs were found effective and, and effective in improving students' feelings and behaviors. Uh, attitudes and school performance. So this is, this is really important research. But in addition to just uh, trying to establish what outcomes uh, out-of-school programs can achieve, what this research did was also identify certain features of programs that lead to better outcomes. And we uh, characterize these with this anacronym SAFE. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what those um, different features of programs are. Uh, first of all, the way we categorize them is, is they, they are sequenced. That means they are connected and coordinated to achieve this objective around social-emotional. They're active in that they use active learning practices. They're focused, so it means that at least one component 
has a focus on promoting social and personal uh, growth. It's explicit and a good amount of time is devoted to it. So the research really suggests that quality after school programs can improve a range of outcomes. Social emotional development is an important outcome in addition to academics and that both uh, content and process are important. And if you want to fund effective programs, the SAFE framework might be uh, a, a good framework to consider. So that was just the short overview that I wanted to provide in terms of CASEL's work in this area. But more important is now um, to turn it over to our first speaker. Uh, Hannah Batiste is going to speak next. And I just want to remind everybody, uh, please don't forget to go ahead and you can start posing questions as our speakers are presenting. Uh, I'll be fielding those questions and, and at the end of them, uh, of the speaker, we will have time for those questions and then we will also have an opportunity at the very end um, to field questions as well. You might want to think about a few things as you're listening to these three speakers. How can out-of-school programs maximize um, their impact on participants' SEL skills? How can grant makers allocate resources in ways that encourage or enable out-of-school time programs to foster skill development? And how important is this to you as a grant maker? How does this align with your grant making strategy? So just a few things to keep in mind. Anna, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, just wanted to tell you guys a little bit more about SCE before I jump into my presentation. So SCE is a Chicago-based foundation. We're about four years old, and we are, as you can see here on this slide, SCE is a social investment organization. So we're invested in shaping a learning ecosystem that kind of reimagines learning for a 21st century. With our first program area in digital learning about four years ago, our approach was to increase access to high quality learning through screen time. So, and with our recently launched social and emotional learning program area, we have a few initiatives, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, so I want to share with you all a few things today. The background on SCE's strategy with our social and emotional learning program broadly and a little bit more about our most recent initiative, which is ongoing right now, the Social and Emotional Learning Challenge. So this slide kind of represents some of the leverage points we were looking at as we started to explore this space, which started with the question, why do some young people thrive when others don't in situations of disadvantage? So we looked at many different areas, and we sort of realized that what we were looking at, what made the difference for so many young people is that they had social and emotional support and skills, and that's what often makes the difference. And we also learned, as, as Castle just presented to us, that the after-school space really is the natural venue to champion a lot of this kind of work, especially because there's a lot of data showing that emotional intelligence and other kinds of soft skills can be more important in determining life success than IQ and academics alone. So we looked at the following areas to sort of elevate SEL before we started deciding on the first initiative in our program area. So these areas are elevating the practices. As we just heard in the previous presentation, we know that there are certain features that promote positive youth development, but there's less known about the particular methods that leverage growth in particular skills. So we really wanted to focus on elevating the practices that are linked to specific outcomes. So that involves identifying the best tools because SEL is not one size fits all. It doesn't encompass all domains at once. It's very idiosyncratic. So how can we help practitioners specifically find methods that are helpful for particular skill growth for young, for young people? So rather than focusing methods on whether or not they, redu they reduce risk, we wanted to see methods that were linked to seeing the positive development of particular skills because we think that'll drive adoption of the best approaches. But along with all of that, we have to make sure we're measuring impact. So how do we link program experience to youth behavior change over time and across context? And that's something that the field is dealing with broadly. But we think that this is something to really focus on if funders are interested in SDL, not just the practices and the tools, but also making sure that we can make some type of correlation between the skills and the practices. 
So I'll go on to the next slide, which talks a little bit more about the specific initiative we launched after a year of exploration into this space, which is the Social and Emotional Learning Challenge. Um, and many of you may know about this. And essentially, this initiative is, is meant to really highlight the practitioners who are working with youth every day, who are doing really important and impactful work with young people. And as you'll see on this slide, we haven't really put forth a definition of SEL that is exclusive or definitive, and that's very intentional because we understand that, again, SEL is idi idiosyncratic, that many people approach it from their distinct frameworks. So we really wanted to put forth a definition that was all-encompassing of those many pluralities. So specific to this challenge, what we've done is we've asked our, we've asked our well, soon-to-be grantees, we haven't selected grantees yet, we've asked them to put forth their definition of what skill growth looks like in their context. And we're put, piecing that together to tell a story about how SEL works for teenagers. So our goal really with this is to develop a practical theory of how social and emotional growth is nurtured in the after-school context. So beyond just what are the features and what are the elements, what are the specific methods that staff use? How can we make those tangible rather than just magical? How can we make those apparent to other practitioners who are doing similar work so that they can have more impactful outcomes. And we chose this method of grant making over traditional research because we wanted to directly fund impactful exceptional work. We wanted to learn alongside our partners and we wanted to discover a greater range of organizations that we might have through a different process. And I should also mention that we're working with the Weikart Center as our research partner for this initiative. So they're doing a lot of the work on actually developing this theory. But it started with a question from us, from SCE, about what is it that makes young people thrive and how can we learn more about those methods that make that happen in the after school context. So a little bit about what we intend with all of this. So as I mentioned, there were several leverage points. We want to see, we want to see more of the practitioners who are out there trying to do this work have those resources readily available to them about what works and why and for what purpose. So the outcome of this year plus long initiative with five to seven grantees will be that we will have a field guide that will provide other workers, other youth workers, executives and policymakers with resources for making SCL a more intentional component. We also want to raise the profile of SCL because oftentimes as we all know, youth workers and the youth services field broadly is not a very well-rewarded profession, I'll say. And although we're recognizing more and more these days that SEL is so integral to success, we still aren't placing the right type of value on the people who kind of make that happen for young people. So that's one of our intentions behind this. And we also want to see smarter investments in SEL. So beyond just funding the after-school program that does recreation with kids, kind of pushing all the, the entire youth services sector to think more intentionally about how SBL can be an intentional component so that we can invest in a, more, in a smarter way to advance these outcomes. So that about wraps up my presentation, and I hope that you guys have, if you have questions, that you'll ask them. And thank you. Thank you, Hannah. That was great. Um, one, one quick question it is, um, one question came in from, from uh, Ronald Ottinger. Is this national or, or focused exclusively in Chicago? Oh, sorry. I should have mentioned this is a national initiative, and we actually are in the process of reviewing proposals right now for the challenge initiative. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, another question that came in during your presentation uh, was from Nate Bruckner of the uh, Walter Johnson Foundation. and. He asked, uh, what is considered the benchmark for comparison for after-school programs? So the benchmark for comparison that we're looking at, if I understand your question correctly, um, with the challenge grant at least, we're looking for, young, for youth organizations to be exceptional in the sense that they really talk, they can identify a distinct method and they can talk about the youth experience in, in the program that kind of conveys a sense of intensity about the youth experience and also an, a sense of authenticity about that experience. So it goes beyond kind of naming the same youth development sort of parameters and indicators and kind of 
this is cliche to say, but kind of they kind of breathe life into that very well-known standard of youth development practice to kind of paint a story of what that looks like in their context. So we won't really know until we start working with these organizations, to be completely honest. But in reviewing these applications, we were reading for that sense of an articulated method. Great, thank you. Um, Nate, if, if, uh, if I, I want to make sure that addressed your, your question, so please feel free to uh, uh, give me a bit more direction if you'd like uh, Hannah to add anything or elaborate on anything related to your question. Are there any other questions uh, specifically for, for Hannah? We have about one, one or two more minutes before we need to move on to the next speaker. Okay, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and move on and uh, that way we'll just, any time that we accumulate during the uh, presentations, we can add on to the end for open conversation. Okay, so our next speaker uh, is Charles Smith uh, from, from the Weikert Center. I'll turn it over to you now, Charles. Charles, you may be muted. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello? Great. Fantastic. Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to talk with you all this afternoon about effective investment in social emotional learning after school. Um, my presentation is not about specific social emotional learning skills or the names of those skills. Uh, so I'm going to start with a couple of assumptions that underlie my, my presentation. I'm just going to assume that the folks listening already know what SEL skills are that you're interested in. Um, and that you think that good or effective or however you define high quality after school programs are an intervention that is well fit to growing those skills. So we're leaving one of the big tough questions out right from the start and moving on to a discussion of tools and how to improve the, uh, the effectiveness of investment. Given those assumptions, I want to focus on how funders can use existing performance improvement and accountability tools to increase the effectiveness of SEL practices at scale. I'll say that again, how funders can use existing performance improvement and accountability tools to increase the effectiveness of SEL practices at scale. Several key words here, tools used by funders referring to standards, program evaluation, professional development, uh, various kinds of accountability tools like RFPs and reports. Um, another key word, effective practices that are embedded in after school programs or settings. And that's referring especially to uh, what the adults and the youth do in their respective role. What the managers do, what the frontline staff do, really what do the kids do as well um, when they demonstrate effective practices. And then finally scale, which refers to um, the embedding of SEL practices across many settings. So the underlying message in my presentation is that most after school funders and their grantees already transact in each of these domains performance tools, best practices, scaled implementation. It's just a matter of getting them all lined up and focused on SEL. Now I say it's just, but let's, let's assume that it could be easy. When they're all lined up, they constitute a performance management systems, and these systems, it turns out, are one of the real strengths of the after school sector. Most simply, a performance management system focused on SEL would require that you first identify the active ingredients for social-emotional learning, both the standards for adult practice and the youth skills, that you would occasionally measure those things, especially in behavioral terms, because the behavioral data is the most actionable. And third, that you'd use those sources of information for action to manage towards better performance, better outcomes. Um, fortunately, as I said, the after school field's already got pretty good infrastructure started in this regard. So it's in the context of this presentation, it's about tweaking uh, our existing work to get more intentional around SEL practices. Let me jump into the four recommendations. Specifically, let me see if I can get my slide changed here. So the four recommendations, I'll just go through them in, in order. Um, the first is focusing on how skills grow. Learning from the science of skill development, we can do some pretty useful demystification of outcomes talk. And I've got outcomes talk in parentheses in my notes here. Um, for example, when we turn to the, the scientific literature on skill building, there are some some characteristics of how skills grow. Skills are highly context dependent. 
um, they, they don't automatically transfer to other settings. This means that we need to think more intentionally about both uh, program designs for after school settings and the other places where we want those skills to show up, such as school day classrooms. Another characteristic of skill development is that the shape of learning, its trajectory, is very scalloped and irregular rather than linear. And what this means that, is that young people need lots of opportunities to practice, practice, practice those skills. They need the opportunity to progress and regress and over time achieve mastery. Another attribute of skill development is that modeling from an adult or a peer are probably the most powerful, learnings of, most powerful of learning supports. So when we think about context dependency, the shape of learning being scalloped, that modeling is a really powerful support, there are other attributes of skill development we could talk about. When we think about those with staff, when we change our outcomes talk to a discussion about skills and about how frequently youth are exposed to these conditions, you get into some great conversations and different kinds of conversations that you, than you typically get into when we talk about accountability for outcomes. The second recommendation is to set standards for best practice. Um, Good program standards are in effect little theories that describe best practices for program managers and direct teaching staff. Um, when we start to talk about the actual skills that the kids engage in, you can also think about those as best practices as well for the youth. We need clear standards for point of service interactions, where the, how the adults and the kids get along, that communicate the critical design elements and the staff practices that animate those designs, and the behavioral indicators, again, of, of the youth. There are lots of best practice standards out there. Um, Evidence-based curricula describe best practices in a sense, so do quality assessment tools. There are a number of explicit program designs that are focused on SEL. Uh, the folks at Public Profit, I think this week uh, released, or last week, released a really cool guide that included all these types of, of standards. They describe what you do, what are the best practices to grow social and emotional learning. A key point is that when a uh, specific skill domain is, is, are identified, a lot can be done by local expert practitioners who have good ideas about how to do this work and can organize information from the growing evidence base on, on after school and schools and other settings. A lot of people who work in our field do read the research and do read policy documents and are thinking about these issues. And so by getting them together and agreeing on what's important with their program design, a lot of progress can be made. The third uh, recommendation is to require continuous improvement. Um, continuous improvement, probably along with attendance, should be the high stakes accountabilities in our field. There are many models of continuous improvement. They all include some combination of assessing performance against a standard, reviewing that information and planning, and then acting to, to improve performance, the plan, do, check, act cycle, if you will. Um, RFPs and year end reports could require evidence about how grantees measured performance against the standard for SEL practices um, and then use that information to make adjustments to their work. In fact, RFPs and year end reports can become primarily about those kinds of continuous improvement cycles when the standards are set well. Note that we're not just talking about me uh, measuring individual use skills here, but also about what the program managers and the teachers are doing the implementation of the best practices themselves, they attach to roles. So the role of the manager, the role of the instructor, and again, even the role of the youth can be a focal point for best practice or the demonstration of skills. The final recommendation is to build capacity of the quality improvement systems and quality improvement organizations that are emerging in our field, and which in many ways are state of the art for those kinds of quality intermediary or intermediary support organizations. Um, I have a sl another slide here which makes the point. It's, it's uh, from a, a guide published by the Wallace Foundation where they did a study. And the basic point, it's, it's really worth uh, Googling and taking a look at this if you haven't seen it. The point is there's been a lot of investment in this intermediary capacity already. It can sit in a lot of different kinds of entities, both public, private, um, nonprofit. Um, these, uh, Investing in these uh, quality intermediaries and quality improvement systems, especially the intermediaries, is also uh, cost effective because those intermediaries have their own agendas and they are also out seeking other additional resources to bring to exactly these purposes. So they are resource aggregation organizations really are focused on the kinds of work that we're talking about in this set of recommendations. As a final point uh, in the after school field, 
um, and in particular for SEL in the after school field, we're likely doing a lot of the things right already. And the major challenge is that we're doing them too lightly to have substantively important effects. So the emphasis on continuous improvement as reflected in these recommendations is just the operational side of moving to a standards-driven or an evidence-based practice model. You have to be aware of how intensively you're implementing best practices, how engaged the kids and staff are in the process. Again, the good news is that we're already, we've already got the tools uh, being implemented at scale, best practice standards and measures, continuous improvement methods, met methods quality improvement organizations and systems. Uh, we now just need to focus those resources on SEL skills. So with that, I'll stop and, and would be happy to address any questions. Great. Thanks, Charles. Um, I was wondering, can, sorry, can you just um, provide a little bit more detail, uh, elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by QIS and QIO again, just to make sure everybody understands? Sure. So there, QIS and QIO, of course, there's a lot of div diversity there. But uh, starting with the organizations, the quality intermediary organizations, um, those are typically nonprofits. Um, but they also exist right in public sector agencies. So um, in some states, the folks who administer and fund the 21st Century Community Learning Centers themselves also deliver a lot of the technical assistance. So they are a quality intermediary organization. Um, another, you know, the, the folks at Primetime in Palm Beach County are a very well-known quality um, intermediary organization, PASA, in, in Rhode Island. They might not call themselves a quality intermediary organization, but they work on improving performance of the out-of-school time sector. Great. Thank you. And, and someone was asking for some examples of quality intermediary systems as well. So the word we would use would be quality improvement systems. QIS is the acronym. Um, we wrote a guide for the Wallace Foundation on building quality improvement systems, um, which is available online. I think it's called Building Quality Improvement Systems. Um, they are the variation, if you know, the early childhood field where they have quality rating and improvement systems. Uh, the quality improvement systems are similar. They work across sites, often in cities or states, and they're designed to um, and the nice thing about the after school field especially is they're designed around lower stakes accountability principles in many cases. So they're they are very different um, in very important ways, or they're, they're different in very important ways from the quality rating and improvement systems or from No Child Left Behind as an as a accountability approach. Great. Thank you. Uh, and you're, you may, I'd like to give you an opportunity maybe to also address uh, the question that was posed earlier by, by Nate Bruckner about benchmarks for comparison. I think, I think you touched on a lot of this in your, in your talk, but if there was anything else you wanted to maybe add or elaborate on in, in terms of how uh, programs can sure. in some comparisons in that way. Yes, yeah, so I'll take it a slightly different direction than Hannah did, which I, I, that was such an interesting response regarding the, the challenge itself. So um, two points. One is uh, standards are in a sense benchmarks. They describe practice with, that's fully implemented. So in a sense, that's a benchmark already. And again, there are many standards documents. And this is the second point. Standards or benchmarks in this field and for these purposes, I think are, you can make a really good argument for the local nature of the benchmarks. Um, when we measure performance either of what managers do or what staff do when they're giving, providing instruction or even what the kids do, we want to provide a norm for the other systems and settings, uh, the other programs in that system. So in Michigan, when we set a norm for the 21st century system, we compare them to their peers. We don't know a ton, enough to set benchmarks. So if you, if you pick an aspect of practice, let's say the opportunities to plan, for kids to plan what they're going to do, we don't know how frequently that has to happen. We don't, our science has not yet made it to that micro level. So let's, let's talk about how frequently planning happens in all the programs like ours that work with us. And let's try to find the low performers in that group. That's, a, that's a, the localness of benchmarks, um, in, I think, in both child development and in the, in the staff practices is probably an important principle. The important point is just because we get absolutely no guidance on what the benchmarks should be from social science doesn't mean we don't need them. Because people want to attain the benchmark. It's a motivation. It's the way performance feedback works. So setting benchmarks based on local norms is probably very important. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Um, one, one other question that came in, and I, this relates to what you're, I, I think, talking about now in terms of levels, but can you explain a little bit more what you meant by doing it too lightly? So if we don't have empirical guidance, how, do you, how can funders focus on that and judge you know, what an example of doing something too lightly is versus not? Yeah, so um, we, I don't know how familiar people are with our work at the Weigert Center. So we have a, a point in time quality assessment that is kind of the core of our work. And we can step into an organization and at a given point in time identify their, you know, their, it, we identify a set of best practices. They sound like a lot like everybody else's best practices. We can identify how intensively those practices are being delivered at that point in time. But we, because you only go once to observe, we don't know what's happening on all the other successive days. And many program designs will, for example, project-based learning is a, is a is a best practice um, for kids to have uh, control over their lo own learning circumstances. There are a number of, of benefits of that. But we don't know how intensive that, that exposure to the elements of project-based learning is. You know, if the project it takes two sessions to complete and is really very light, we're doing project-based learning, but it's not a very intensive experience for the kids. They haven't really importantly had the ex opportunity and this is for adolescents especially, to, though we could think of other developmentally appropriate applications for younger kids, but for adolescents they haven't had a chance to, to own the direction of their own work and to experience challenges and successfully negotiate through challenges of real consequence. And to decide, again another really important thing for social emotional learning, to, for the kids to, make the, to, to have the experience of controlling their own subjective experience of the, of the environment. How do I, you know, deal with the fact that I'm coming in here and I'm not done, and we've had, you know, we can't, we're having challenges getting our project off the ground, our service learning project, or building a boat, or whatever it is. We're having challenges getting it off the ground, and I have the opportunity to actually work through that and be successful, and maintain my good attitude, my subjective experience of that work, and rather than just get really bummed out or, or be, feel very negative about it. So, our guess. When we look at the, at the after school field, especially for adolescents, middle school and high school age kids, um, there, there is not the project or the continuity of the experience that goes deep enough probably to have uh, you know, a measurable, detectable effect. We are often approaching it from the evaluation perspective. We want the effect to be big enough that we can find it. Great. Thank, thank you, Charles. Uh, we've had at least two or three other questions come in, but I think um, I'm going to hold those uh, until the end um, and move on to the next speaker. But don't worry, the questions that have come in will be addressed uh, at the end. So let me uh, advance the slides here for a minute and uh, move on and introduce uh, Karen Pittman. And Karen, I'm going to turn things over to you now. Great. Thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation so far. Um, I'm going to do my own version of Truth in Advertising, uh, which is to let people know that uh, the Weikert Center uh, is uh, actually a part of the Forum for Youth Investment. Um, uh, so we have a sequential set of relationships between the funder, between Charles and, uh, and the Forum, which has uh, a broader agenda in terms of uh, the kind of work that it does. Um, very quickly, the the forum uh, increasingly is focused on uh, three relevant terms, I think, here. Standards, and we've been talking a lot about standards, uh, solutions, practical ways to uh, help uh, both decision makers, which could be practitioners um, or uh, local decision makers, funders, policy makers, actually find solutions that allow them to improve continuously against standards, um, and then the continuous effort to really figure out how we, how we measure, uh, track, and communicate success. And over the years, the forum has developed a broad theory of change that suggests that if we are going to really improve child and youth outcomes, um, not particular outcomes, for example, reducing teen pregnancy, but overall outcomes that relate to young people being, as we say, sort of ready for college, work, and life, um, that they're developmentally on track to be productive, connected, and healthy, and safe, we have to then make sure that the places where they spend their time and family school and community are coordinated, accessible, well used or well attended, and high quality. Um, and the Weikert Center fits in very much um, into that 
middle gear um, of us taking ideas about what it means for programs to be coordinated and high quality and bringing those um, into impact uh, through interventions, uh, in particular in the after school space, but not exclusively. And then the final part of the forum's work really focuses on helping leaders come together in partnerships to take shared accountability uh, for goals, uh, for using data together, uh, and for developing uh, and um, implementing community level or system level uh, actions that make the other gears move. Uh, so in that context, um, I'm going to sort of talk uh, a little broadly uh, coming up out of after school and staying focused on um, SEL competencies to figure out um, what it is that we need to do. Um, this slide should look more complicated than it does. It's actually a slide that builds, and I forgot that we didn't build in, in uh, ReadyTalk. So if you can imagine, uh, that's a very easy way to think about readiness, child youth outcomes. Um, behind that gear um, is actually a target. So imagine a target with three rings. The inside ring is, is academic and vocational productivity. So young people need to be productive. Um, and we often target the fact that we want them to meet certain academic, and then as they get older, uh, certain work-related or vocational employment outcomes. The outer ring of that target um, is sort of health and safety. And we have lots of public health uh, indicators that we track for young people from obesity to pregnancy, et cetera. It's the middle ring that we want young people to really be socially and civically connected um, in which, uh, as Hannah discussed, we're really sort of catching up um, in making sure that those competencies that are to be in that middle ring are well defined, ideally consistently defined, and also measured, and ideally measured not just at a program level but at a population level so that they can start to get in the water in the larger ways that we define success. Let's see if I can advance the slide here. All right. Um, you, someone asked about transfer, um, and this uh, slide uh, actually was uh, developed by the Likert Center. Um, we use it a lot to really talk about the challenge uh, as we talk more broadly about how we take this idea of readiness and get more intentional about helping young people uh, get there. So if we focus for a second in on that box that says SEL skills and beliefs, those interpersonal, intrapersonal, cognitive skills, um, that we're talking about, however we define them. Um, as, you know, as was said at the beginning, um, we've got a huge amount of evidence that those SEL skills both are important. We could really call them gateway skills or competencies. When young people have those skills and competencies, they tend to do better um, at whatever broader outcomes we want them to achieve, whether that's graduating from high school on time, uh, building uh, STEM skills, um, or uh, avoiding risky behaviors. We've got an increasing amount of evidence that, that creating uh, and building those social and emotional uh, skills and competencies really does have a payoff. Uh, as Charles said, we've also got, uh, and, and the capital research shows, we've also got increasing evidence that when young people are actively engaged in high quality settings, um, where those skills are actually um, acknowledged and young people have chances to actually practice those skills, um, as Charles talked about. So when we've got that setting happening, then we know that we actually are getting improvements in those skills. So that green box, as Charles was talking about, we may have a point of service session in which we observe and we can look at there's quality instruction happening and we see young people are actually engaged. They're responding to the arc of instruction that's happening um, in, that, in that particular program. We also know, even though we're not observing it directly, that that program is actually allowing young people sufficient time um, because of the duration um, that they participate in the program to practice uh, in that setting so that those skills are being built and moved towards mastery. And then the question is, do those skills transfer? Whether they transfer down the hall, from uh, the, the program in which they were really focusing on skills to a program that is now focused on employment and training, or they actually transfer from the after school setting all the way into school or into a work training program um, or into a prevention program in which we're really trying to get young people um, to avoid certain behaviors, whether those skills transfer 
um, in large part uh, depends on how much the young person has mastered them and made them uh, a core part of how they really approach the world and how they approach any kind of problem or challenge um, or opportunity that they have. But transfer also is dependent upon that setting acknowledging those skills um, and continue, continuing to both expect that those skills are going to be present, but also in ways rewarding uh, when those skills um, are exhibited. So we can do things to increase the transfer, um, and we can come back in the Q&A and talk about examples of where when in school settings we've been explicit about naming those skills um, and even helping young people sort of assess uh, and, and uh, reward, get credit for those skills, transfer happens much faster. Um, but the final thing that I want to suggest as we go from the idea of that blue box really increasing uh, the likelihood that the after-school or out-of-school time programs um, that you all are supporting um, as funders have an intentional focus on SEL skill development. Um, they're meeting quality standards, even if they're local quality standards, that are allowing for sufficient engagement so that those skills are being developed and they have an opportunity to grow and mature. When we get to the question of transfer, I'd like to suggest that there's power in thinking about the fact that often the programs that, we, the programs that are running um, after school programs could often also be working in other settings. They could be getting funding from juvenile justice and child welfare um, to work with young people who are transitioning to independence, young people coming out of foster care. They could be getting prevention dollars to work on obesity or teen pregnancy um, or youth violence issues. They could, if they're working with high school age young people, uh, be engaging in employment training um, or at least employment exposure. So in addition to having schools as the target where we want that transfer to happen, if we're building this capacity in after school programs, out of school time programs, youth development programs more broadly, programs that because they are community based, um, they're in, more informal uh, in their approach to how they work with young people, and the more interactive may have more time to really focus on these skills, building their capacity to actually know that they are creating SEL skills, have ways to actually measure consistently across their network um, those SES skills, means that they're becoming a very valuable commodity for that community, not just um, for their capacity to partner with schools to improve academic achievement, but partner with an array of other programs. So the last thing that I'll, that I'll put up uh, is that I think there's a real challenge that we can look at um, as we continue to get more and more data that there's a difference between competence and credentials, that increasingly we have young people who are coming out of high school, sometimes even coming out of uh, an associate's degree or community college. They're coming out with a credential, but they're not coming out with the competencies that employers would like to see the things that were up on the slide um, at the very beginning. So they're not coming out with problem solving skills. They're not coming out with teamwork skills, with good communication skills. Um, they don't have the kinds of skills that, young, that employers are looking for, um, and often they don't have the kinds of skills that allow them to effectively uh, persist uh, in college. Uh, so that we really, as we're having accountability push back on those systems, not only on the K-12 system, um, to be accountable not just for the credential, but with the Common Core Standards, start to be accountable for delivering competence, at least um, as defined by the Common Core, we're finding that systems that are getting public funding, just to be blunt, those systems that are getting the public dollars more than the after school programs are necessarily, or certainly getting larger uh, buckets of public dollars, really have three choices. They can continue business as usual and then really fail to meet accountability targets, whether that's graduation rates, recidivism rates, et cetera. They can recognize the importance of building SEL skills and then significantly revamp their practice to make sure that they're doing that. Um, and we're, what we're learning is that that's not as easy as, as it seems. Um, in the youth development out of school space, we're actually formalizing practices that were naturally there informally. Um, but in a lot of these other systems, there are very different practices that often compete with the kinds of methods um, that we know uh, teachers broadly define need to use to build SEL skills. So revamping practice can be a challenge. The third option is to actually partner 
um, with practitioners and programs that focus on SEL. Uh, so as we're thinking about how, or as you all are thinking about how as funders you really invest in after school and out of school programs um, to really become uh, these hubs for natural SEL skill development, uh, a recommendation is that you even talk to uh, your program officer partners across the hall who may be thinking about child welfare or juvenile justice or prevention or uh, employment training because they could think about using those programs to build some of the same skills. Thank you, Karen. Uh, so, so basically trying to get other systems to partner in, in authentic ways around SEL is what, is what you're suggesting, right? Yes. Yeah. Are they, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? We, we had some, uh, some interest in, in, in your thoughts on that, and I know you, you were probably worried about time, but there's, there's definite interest in your response on that. Um, so, so the ways that we could partner with other, uh, others other than schools to elaborate on this? Yeah, I think just, just how, to, how to partner in that way, if, if you could um, suggest any other strategies. Uh, related to that also, you know, ways to maybe actually try to influence policy change that, that fosters uh, out-of-school programs and other youth learning settings to really succeed in SEL. Good. Um, well, I think one thing to do uh, in, in terms of partnering as you're looking at grantees is to, uh, is to make sure that, that um, as funders you understand the full footprint um, of your grantees. So if you're uh, funding Boys and Girls Clubs, for example, Boys and Girls Clubs um, certainly operate in the after school hours, um, but they get funding, uh, they get lots of prevention funding, they get funding from the Department of Justice, they get funding uh, from HUD, the Department of Housing, uh, and as such, they're really being held accountable for some of those broader goals uh, of preventing problems or reducing recidivism um, or reducing obesity as well as they're being held accountable to be good after school partners. So I think one place to start really might be doing um, a mapping of uh, where, where your current grantees sort of land, how broadly they fit into that, uh, and I won't put the slide back up, but then into that sort of broader footprint um, of funding that comes into programs and communities for young people. Uh, the second uh, opportunity, I think, as you said, is to really think about policy um, and begin to have dialogues uh, because the, the research is there uh, with those who are now sort of under the crunch of uh, trying to meet accountability goals um, in child welfare or in juvenile justice. Uh, increasingly, communities are, are looking at special, special populations like young people coming, coming out of foster care. Um, we certainly have now a, a major national initiative um, you know, on young men of color. All of those are opportunities to uh, bring a broader set of partners to the table than those who are just thinking about after school, but partners who are going to readily understand the importance of uh, making sure that, that the young people that they are focused on um, are building these skills. So that in some ways, leading with the skills and starting a conversation with a broader set of funders or policymakers who are interested in improvements in a population can bring it back to the role that after school and out of school programs can play. Thank you, Karen. Uh, one last question for you specific to your presentation, and then I think um, we'll kind of open it up to all the speakers because I have some, some general questions that probably everybody can respond to. But, uh, um, Ronald Ottinger asked about some examples, some be best examples of the Quest process, maybe what investments are needed and, and for what. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Or I'll let Charles speak about that since it's, it's his model. If you want a practical example, Charles, do you want to speak to that? Well, the, the way we use the Quest model is to have people have after school systems articulate their theories. What we found is that after school systems are really clear on the left hand side of the model and even further left than Quest. So like the professional development they do and how they design their program and they're clear about quality. And then the specific skills they're focused on, the, their logic models start to get sparse. And so this is a, and then when they talk about how they align with the school day to make transfer more likely, it gets even sketchier. So it's a model for us to help people get more explicit about their logic model of what they're trying to do. That, in terms of evaluation, the missing piece is the measurement of skills. 
Um, we got lots of great data on academic achievement and school success. We have, we're increasingly, we've got a lot of data on quality and engagement. We just, the field lacks good measures of skills, period. Um, and skill change is often not included in evaluation design. So we just don't know a lot about it. Great. Thanks, Charles. Um, and maybe while you're both sort of responding, I think um, this issue of uh, transferability of skills, uh, there was a, a response, Charles, that, that you gave to uh, a question that came in from Tasha Webb at, at the Wallace Foundation. She asked about skill transference and, and how that can be supported and facilitated. And also, um, Gina Dalma of Silicon Valley Community Foundation had a similar so I think there's a lot of interest on that, and, and you guys spoke a little bit, but I want to make sure uh, some additional thoughts that you have, uh, we have time to, to revisit that topic for a few minutes. Karen, do you want to start, or do you want me to? Um, sure. I'll give you a quick example. Um, for those of you who, who may be familiar um, with the, the New Tech High model, uh, for example, and they certainly encourage young people to go out into their communities and, and have uh, partners that they work with, um, and again, this is high school, so we're talking about a, a high school after school model, which is less sort of a five day model. But explicitly inside of the high school, um, what, what teachers and administrators uh, do is to sit down and look at not only the common core standards, but also look at the list of SEL skills that they want to make sure their young people lead with problem solving, communication, teamwork, work ethic. Those skills are named. Those skills are up on the wall. Um, but more importantly, those skills are both built into lesson plans and they're built into students' report cards. Um, so that when a teacher is developing a lesson plan, it's not just about how do I make sure that they cover the content. There have to be actual methods that are associated with how I would be able to build and practice communication skills, teamwork skills, etc. So that that, that um, the idea of actually being intentional about making sure that the methods match the skills that you want young people to demonstrate um, is there. And then because young people are getting a report card, uh, and some of those skills are actually re referenced um, and assessed by their peers, they're getting a report card in which they're getting a score on the content, but 50% of their grade is also coming from um, whether or not they're demonstrating those skills. So in that sense, partnering with out-of-school out providers <clears throat> is much easier because the language is there, the assessment is there, and so if you really want to see whether young people who are doing internships or apprenticeships or working in an arts program to put on a, a, you know, a play, if those young people are actually getting more practice time that's having an impact on, on how well they're doing, you've actually got assessment already happening and you've got those skills named. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I want to be able to uh, also uh, make sure Hannah has a chance to add anything if, if she wants to on that, or I have one or two other questions that actually I'll pose to all of you. Hannah, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? No, you can go ahead and pose the other questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, I, we had one question come in uh, from Ann Rosewater, uh, who's with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading about developmental issues. Um, how should some of the recommendations that have been made by, by all of you uh, be applied differentially in programs serving children at different grade levels, younger grade levels versus older grade levels? So if any of you want to respond to that. I would just, this is Charles, I would just say that um, I think for the kind of performance systems approach recommendations I was talking about, a lot of our, a lot of the knowledge of how these systems work come from the early childhood world. I mean, elementary is tough. It's tough. You got, because your kids are really, developmentally there are some important breaks between five and six, and then between like, you know, 10 and 11. So elementary itself is developmentally segmented, and that's a problem that basically we all wrestle, struggle with. Um, but assuming that your developmental, your expectations for child behavior and child development are appropriate, um, the system's work comes right out of the comes out of the early childhood field. Thanks, Charles. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay. Um, let me let me ask another uh, question then about. Um, 
we had one speaker, uh, Suzanne Connor, uh, raising, raising attention, asking everyone to think about arts and culture funders and, and grantees that offer arts instruction um, within uh, different settings. So uh, any of you have any thoughts about, um, about that particular kind of setting or the advantage of that particular focus? Um, this is this is Karen. Um, arts and culture funders and, and those programs in particular are really uh, very uh, important for skill development. Uh, you know, we've written a couple of things on them and, and partnered with them, in part because when you go back to sort of the, the Castle Safe model, they really tend to have a, a, a natural arc to the work that young people are doing. They tend to have uh, clearly you're both developing skills. You're usually working in teams. There's often a public presentation performance element. Um, to the work as well, which, which gets you uh, validation of mastery at the end of the process. Um, and, and, and they're a natural draw uh, for young people, and they also tend to uh, provide experience that, 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 especially when you're getting up into the teen years, um, looks a little bit more like you're actually practicing what could be uh, a career. And so for lots of reasons, uh, in, in particular folks that have focused on trying to make sure that there are um, out-of-school time, quality out-of-school time opportunities for teenagers have really gravitated towards, uh, towards the arts as a place to, to really build those skills. And just to add to that, this is Hannah, I think that, at least from SDE's perspective, we think that arts and culture type of programs are really beneficial for SDL skill growth. And we'd like to see more arts and culture funders kind of incorporating some kinds of SEL measures so that we can fully take stock for what kinds of benefits the young people are getting out of those types of experiences. Thanks, Hannah. I actually had another question for you. I was wondering uh, if you wouldn't mind commenting on, on what sort of surprises you've encountered uh, so far in reading proposals for your initiative. Uh, what, you know, what's your assessment of, of how robust the field is? Well, something that some of my colleagues have remarked is that we got 240 applications for the initial LOI stage. Um, and more than half of them were very impassioned letters describing the work that they do with young people. So I wouldn't call, say that that's a surprise. It, it reinforced a really great feeling we have about this field, which is that people join it because they, they believe in the work that they're doing. And they have a strong sense of the fact that they're helping young people develop these types of skills. So I, I'd say that one thing that was surprising was how, how hard it really is to distinguish how well someone is doing this kind of work. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I have one question that came in from uh, Ash McNeely at Sand Hill Foundation. Uh, Karen, I think this one was, was directed to you. Um, at the macro level, wh why do you think SEL has been implemented too lightly to date? You know, why, why is it picking up steam now? What's your sense? Um, well, I think in some ways the old adage that you know, what, what gets measured gets done, we really haven't um, had the same kind of population level measures of these skills, uniform measures that are done routinely you know, by schools or, or other folks. And so they're invisible. I mean, clearly we know that they're important. Um, and they lead to the kind of things that we measure. But in some ways, I would say the very consistent push that we've had over the past five to seven years from employers and from higher education basically saying we're sending them young people who are not ready to use what they have has pushed the conversation um, about what readiness is and whether readiness is just a credential or readiness really has to be um, some skills behind it. Um, I think in some ways that has really sort of loosened up the conversation and allowed um, us to be able to talk about the fact that we need to have those kinds of skills. Then we're having the kind of examples like New Tech High and other places that are now being explicit even in a school setting about naming those skills and seeing what difference it makes when you have this combined approach. So the pressure of thinking, if I'm going to get academic outcomes, I have to just drill, drill, drill it on academics as opposed to I really need to take some of that time to make sure young people are building these core competencies that allow them to actually learn and master the content that I want them to master. 
that's you know I think that's one of the things that's happening. And then um, the other thing is I do think we're getting somewhat better um, uh, at measuring, and we're coming at this from the other side um, with the important studies like uh, the Durlock and Weisberg study of defining quality in a way that it's leading to not just the definition, the delivery of content, but the development, consistent development of a context in which these kind of skills thrive. Great, thanks, Karen. Actually, can we can we take a few minutes to uh, just dig into the policy environment a bit more? What what's your assessment? Sorry for the uh, you can hear the sirens <laughs> outside in, in the street. Uh, what's your assessment of how education reform? Uh, how the national conversation is going, how we can leverage it to focus on SEL and, and broaden the definition of learning uh, to, to really include all settings? Well, I mean, we've, you have some room with the Common Core, even though there's pushback on it for, for a variety of reasons, but the, the habits of the mind that are sort of defined and cut across the Common Core standards and we'll, when we drill down to things like, like um, the implementation of Common Core, which is leading to young people really doing more critical thinking, problem solving, teamwork, we're having more room to sort of see the methods come in. And then I think the other thing um, that, that's happening uh, that is, that's useful in this space, uh, again, is that as we're really both partnering with out-of-school folks but tracking um, outcomes, uh, not just in terms of graduation rates, but in terms of uh, success rates moving into the next level. We're getting more policy that's sort of pushing back on K-12 um, to, to have richer or, or sort of more robust definitions of whether they're graduating young people who are ready. And these, things, these kinds of skills are becoming uh, more transparent as a part of that, um, basically as a part of that resume. I'd like to add just a bit to that too. That if we think about the way it worked in early childhood, a lot of you know there's Head Start, of course, but a lot of the really important money came from state legislatures, and a lot of really important support was county and local. And if you think about how getting agreed upon a set of uh, skill measures, um, the high scope child observation record, the Bergant screen. Um, the work sampling system, there were a number of those skill measures that came into prevalence in the 90s that demonstrated that kids' skills were changing during the preschool year and it was making them more ready for school. And as we demonstrated locally in lots of well-designed but local evaluations in states and localities that kids' skills were changing as a result of preschool, I believe um, that that really helped to open up the, the political policy discussion about funding that work in universal pre-K that followed. Um, and I think that's really important here in social emotional learning in the out of school time field too. If that quest model, that skill box is wide open. There are, there, we lack measures that are designed to be sensitive to capture change over time. And if we can do that, if we can invest, invest in improved measures and in local evaluations that demonstrate that, that, ch that kids are changing as, during the after school experience. It doesn't have to be parsing out that experience from everything else, but that, that those trend lines are going up. I think that that also has an impact on, on the understanding of people who, who both create but also implement public policy and have resources. Thank you, Charles. Uh, if there's not a, anyone else who wants to chime in, I, I, I'd like to maybe shift uh, to, to just a slightly different uh, topic. We, we have a few minutes left for our discussion. Um, would, would all of you please comment on uh, if you think summer programs have particular potential for SEL skill building? Uh, you know, there's some advantages to having more time, but then there may be some challenges associated with that, that uh, time frame. Could you discuss that a bit and, and how funders can help? Charles, Anyone? do you want to start since you're working with the summer learning folks? Sure. Uh, yeah, we think summer, I mean, summer is obviously a great opportunity to work on learning and fun and enriching environments, the opportunity gap as well as the achievement gap. Um, you know, we're 
actually making the argument that developing socio-emotional competency or strength, um, and especially you know being able to shape your own experience of the sub your own subjective experience of the world, keeping yourself in a good space. Um, especially for, you know, America is a pretty violent place. There are lots of kids who have been exposed to trauma. Um, so anytime you can work on helping someone, this is positive psychology, right, learned happiness. Anytime you can help someone manage their own subjective experience of the world and fight off the rush to negative judgment, um, you're really helping them a lot. So anytime you can do that, summer is certainly a great time for it. It's a longer day. Um, it's also politically a strategic time to do it if you're going to fund evaluation because there are less competing, we're likely to get closer to the actual effect um, of these kinds of experiences, whereas when we're funding after, do, evaluating after school during the school year, there are many other con contributory or detracting causes um, from those effects, and, and summer um, there's less competition. So uh, you know, it seems like a great place to work on social emotional learning, more time, more intensity, um, uh, I, I, I'm not, you know, how funders can specifically play a role other than just helping to fund more, um, more summer activities. Um, I, I, I don't know. I'll defer that one to Karen. You've probably got an opinion there, Karen. Um, I, I do think that um, I, I think summer, summer in some ways is 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 unclaimed space. Um, it's it's a place where, and Charles's point about less less competition. Um, we just had a conversations in a community with with school and school and community uh, for school leaders, community providers, and parents, um, talking about um, what they wanted for their young people and getting them to explicitly begin to name um, some of these skills. They were very excited about these skills. They were very excited and naturally named the kind of methods that we see easier to implement inside of after school programs um, to be able to, to get those kind of experiences. And then right at the peak of them being excited about wanting their young people to have all these different kind of experiences and build these skills, they said, but they have to do their homework. And so we don't know how we can actually um, really push full forward on expanding after school opportunities that allow young people to have these kinds of experiences, including arts and culture, et cetera but also have them do homework. And their answer wasn't, let's go back into school and rethink homework, or let's go back into school and see how we can get some of these skills actually practiced in school. After a little bit of a pause, what they did naturally was to say was, why don't we shift our focus to summer and make sure that if they can't take full advantage of these kinds of programs during the school year because they have too much homework, they can at least take full advantage of them in the summer. Thanks, Karen. Uh, we, we're approaching the end of the discussion. I, I was wondering if the three of you would mind just each, uh, maybe if, if you take 30 seconds apiece and just say maybe what, what you think the most important things that funders can do to, to help promote uh, SEL skill building in programs. And, and let's just get a one final comment from each of you, and then I'm going to turn things over to Kathleen. Hannah, you want to start? Hi there. Sure, I'll start. I, I think that maybe one of the most important things funders can do with their existing grantees to focus on SEL is to prompt their grantees to think about and articulate what their practices are. Something that Charles mentioned earlier was that programs often can articulate those first two components of that quest model, but they can't talk as clearly about the skill transfer aspect or even in defining the skills they want to see, period. So I think a good step with existing grantees could be to get them to start thinking about that. Fantastic. Thank you. Charles, you want to go next? And are you on mute, Charles? Sorry. Yeah, that was a great answer, Hannah. I would, I would have started there. The other part is if you're giving people resources and asking them to provide services with those resources, uh, turn your accountability requirements into continuous improvement requirements that motivate people to do better. Great advice. Thank you. And, and Karen, do you want to just uh, give your recommendation? 
I would agree with both of those responses, uh, and, and I would add um, encourage and, and create opportunities for your grantees in the after school, out of school space to have these explicit conversations about skills and transfer and the value of them building those skills with school um, prevention providers and, and, and other systems. If you can orchestrate that and get those conversations started, uh, I, I think you'll be surprised at, at where they go from there. Great, thank you. Kathleen, let me turn it over to you because I think we're just about out of time. Thank you so much, Celine. Um, and thank you so much, Karen, Hannah, and Charles for your time and um, for your wise and thought-provoking answers to so many questions. Um, I was listening so much this whole time that I, I wanted to write and listen at the same time, and I mostly listened. So I'm going to go over the, the transcripts, and I'll take some of the key pieces out, and I'll send them out in one of the upcoming newsletters so that people can make sure that they get this, these um, nuggets of great information. Um, so thank you so much. I know that these um, web seminars are, are no um, you know, small task. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for giving us an hour and 15 minutes of your time. Um, and to close out by just um, letting you know, if you don't already, that uh, Grantmakers for Education has an out-of-school time funder network. And um, that network was created in 2009. We are guided by a 10-member steering committee of your peers, many of whom are on the web seminar today. And I thank them for the time and the guidance that they give for designing our programs. And if you'd like to join the Out of School Time Funder Network, which means that you'll get our monthly newsletter and you will receive um, information about our programs and you always have the opportunity to help us design programs and step into a leadership role, um, just send me an email at ostnetwork at edfunders.org. Finally, um, we, GFE has a webinar coming up April 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern or 10 a.m. Pacific a scaling effective professional development for the common core, what should funders look for to support effective professional development. So register at the website. And lastly, I am going to press on you for um, about five more minutes of your time this afternoon. You will receive an email with a evaluation. It really does take five minutes in SurveyMonkey. They are really, really important to us. Um, it is how we know whether our design and our presentation and our content and our topic was effective um, and interesting for you. So please give us those extra five minutes this afternoon so that we can do our best to strive to make our programs better. And um, on behalf of all of us here, thank you so much for your time and have a great afternoon. <laughs>